Hi everyone. Welcome to a presentation on energy alternatives to petroleum. This is unit 3D in your book. Our objectives for this lesson are to describe major sources of energy that have been used throughout history, to describe and evaluate the potential alternative sources of fuels and builder molecules, to evaluate biodiesel as an alternative to petroleum-based diesel fuel, and to describe alternative fuel vehicles in use or those in development. First, let's remember that petroleum is non-renewable and that our primary source of energy is from the sun. This is through photosynthesis, as we discussed in a previous lesson. The energy from the sun is stored as chemical potential energy in those plants. Those plants then give energy to food and energy as food in the form of carbohydrates and oxygen. They feed animals. That energy is used by animals to create other organic molecules. Biomolecules include all of these organic molecules that are found in both plants and animals. This is a diagram that explains that. So the solar energy or the energy from the sun here goes down and it's absorbed by the plants and transferred to chemical energy. It, the leaves are act as natural solar panels. Then that plant is eaten by a grasshopper, which is eaten by a frog and then eaten by a bird. So this stored chemical energy is transferred from the plant to the grasshopper, to the frog, and then to the bird, enabling each in turn to function as a living organism. A little history of energy sources. Until about 1850, our primary source was wood and we used it for heating, cooking, and lighting. Water, wind, and animal power were used for transportation and to power machinery and industrial processes. Imagine the horse pulling the carriage, that kind of thing. Uh, a sailboat, the sail pushes the, the, um, the boat. The wind pushes the sail, pushes the boat. So think of the historical events that match up to the changes in the energy sources on the graph to the right. So notice, we talked about what happened before 1850. Um, after that, we've got an increase in this section here. So there's green along the bottom, that's biomass. The next layer is hydropower, which really didn't come into play until kind of like the 1900s. And then you have coal, petroleum, natural gas, and then nuclear fission. So we've got a lot of different components here. Nuclear fission didn't come into play until the uh, later 1900s, 1980s or so. Natural gas had a huge spike around the same time, but it was began in about 1910. And petroleum is a huge source that we use today, but it kind of began its journey in the early 1900s here, the 1910 area. Coal has been pretty steady since about the 1920s. Okay, it's had some dips as other things kind of pulled forward, but then we realized we kind of still use it a lot, so it goes there. Um, hydropower and biomass are really untapped, but they have shown growth in the past 30 to 50 years or so. So I want you to think about the different historical events that kind of match up with that. So our focus in Unit 3D is to look at alternative fuel and energy sources. So since about 70% of the petroleum used in the U.S. is used for transportation, our conversation is going to primarily talk about how can we change the source that we use, energy source we use for transportation. So even with improvements in public transport and personal vehicles are still very popular and in some cases very necessary in the United States. So what are our alternatives as a fuel source? Well, our first option is called oil shale. What is it? It's from tar sands and oil shale rock. There's something called kerogen inside of the rock. It's a partially formed oil. And when you heat it, it decomposes and makes a material similar to crude oil. It's found in the United States among all sorts of other countries, um, but I focused on the US. It's a uh, major deposits are found in the Rocky Mountains, which are over here. Um, but there's also some in this area here in the Kentucky and Tennessee area and into Indiana and Ohio. And there are challenges. And those current extraction methods uh, use what is equivalent to half a barrel of petroleum. So 
and that just produces a single barrel of shale oil. It also uses enormous amounts of water. So we're looking at using a lot of resources to not get a lot of output, so it, pro it proves to be a challenge. So there's some development that could work, or that could be, there could be more development made here. Another option is coal liqu liquefaction. It's when liquid fuel is produced from coal, it's you convert coal to a liquid fuel and also to builder molecules. So you can see the coal here is directly converted into liquid fuel. This happens in the US. There's actually more coal reserves than petroleum reserves in the United States. So we have the resources right here. It's also located in other areas around the world. Challenges is the cost. Present cost of mining and converting is considerably greater than that of um, then that would produce the same amount of fuel from petroleum. So to get the same amount of fuel as you would get from petroleum, you're gonna cost a lot more. And it's still a non-renewable resource. So we haven't really fixed that piece either. Uh, another option is renewable petroleum replacements. This includes biodiesel. It's a fuel that can be burned in a diesel engine. Um, this can come from any plant or animal fat and it is converted to biodiesel. Currently, this is not used on its own. It's only in use when it's blended with petroleum-based diesel. And um, Yukon, which this is a picture of some of the staff at Yukon, uh, Yukon has been doing this um, on campus. So I have a video for you. Biodiesel is one example under the larger umbrella of what we might call green chemistry, of a way to make our entire lives safer and healthier. My name is Richard Parnas. I'm a professor of chemical engineering here at the University of Connecticut. And in the last few years, we've developed a, uh, a biodiesel reactor here. We use waste vegetable oil that we collect from the dining services here at the University of Connecticut. First, right at this point here, is where we're combining the vegetable oil with the methanol. And then it goes through here, and this is actually a mixer here, and it goes in here, and then it very slowly, over a period of about 20 minutes, flows up the length of the reactor. While it's flowing up the length of the reactor, there's a chemical reaction going on that converts the vegetable oil and methanol to biodiesel and another byproduct called glycerol. The molecules of glycerol agglomerate together and form little droplets and they're heavier than the biodiesel. And so they separate from the biodiesel and fall down to the bottom, just like oil and vinegar salad dressing separate. What is unique about this reactor here, and the reason we have a patent on it, it gives a much better performance for separating out that glycerol, and we don't need a special separation step as is used in most other processes. When we do a one reactor run, we run it for 10 hours or so. One thing that we're looking into in the laboratory now is to clean up the glycerol so that it is much easier to dispose of. We're also interested in quality control. We're able to take a probe from a Raman spectrometer and put it into the stream coming out the top of our reactor and on a second by second basis analyze the composition of that stream. And then we take our product over to our shuttle buses, mix it with the petroleum diesel to help run the shuttle buses around the university. We're working with, with both the university and private investors to raise the capital to put up a commercial scale. Biodiesel has about 30% of the carbon footprint of the petroleum diesel. In fact, ASTM grade biodiesel is so non-toxic, you can actually drink it. Now, you wouldn't drink a bottle of olive oil, but you use it in your cooking. Biodiesel is that level of safety. So just something neat uh, that's going on at UConn right now. And if you choose to go to UConn when you are looking at schools, this could be a program that you could become involved in. Alternative fuel and energy sources. Um, so there's lots of other sources with hydropower, nuclear power, solar power, wind, biomass, and geothermal. We also are looking at alternative approaches, which are things we've covered in the past. This is that green chemistry idea. 
using energy efficient buildings, vehicles and machines, and just thinking about ways to reduce your energy use in general. There's three different types of alternative fuel vehicles that are mentioned in your book. Uh, first is the compressed natural gas. Uh, pros are it's widely available and is there, there's an 80% decrease in carbon monoxide and uh, nitrogen oxide emissions. However, the cons are that they require a compressor in the vehicle, um, which in, makes the cost of the vehicle two to four thousand dollars more. That also, that um, fuel source makes their uh, higher fire risk resulting from a collision. So in, in the event that the car collides or gets into a car crash, there's a higher fire risk with this fuel source. Another option is a fuel cell power. Pros are there's no uh, electrical recharging and it eliminates or substantially reduces air pollutants. It's more efficient than an internal combustion engine, which is a typical vehicle. Um, however, again, there's a high cost and there's challenges that remain in the development of fuel handling and processing options. So there's just some tweaking that needs to happen. And then the third one is the hybrid gasoline electric power. So these are the hybrid cars that you see out on the market now. Um, pros are they automatically switch from electric to electric when possible, and then they use any excess kinetic moving energy, um, and it's converted back to chemical potential energy, which is stored inside the car's battery. However, the con here is that there's still some fossil fuel burning emissions for when it's in that fossil fuel burning um, mode. So one of the things that you're going to be looking at in your, your weekly task is which of these options has the most promise. So let's review. Sources of energy, our primary source is the sun. Um, energy sources have changed throughout history. There's lots of different alternative fuel and energy sources like oil shale, coal liquefaction, renewable petroleum replacements, and then all the other sources that you've heard over and over and over again about. And then there's those three alternate fuel vehicles that are in the market or in development. So you've got compressed natural gas, fuel cell power, and hybrid gasoline electric power. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or post on Google Classroom. Thank you so much.